how's it going, folks? You're back with the Popcorn Square podcast. I am Neff, joined with Kage. And, and this episode's called Internet Killed the Movie Star. Let's jump right into it. Let's just talk about the internet and how it has affected cinema. I would say for the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen the impact of the internet on cinema, good and bad. Um, I think the biggest impact is the spread of information that you get about a film before it comes out, and also the um, amount of access that people have to that information. I've said that the internet is kind of like a double-edged sword for films. It can make or break your film before it even comes out. If there's bad press on your film that hits the internet and people kind of corral that information, disseminate it, and it spreads around, some people might not go see your movie, which will affect the box office, of course. If people hear good things about your movie before it comes out, Or they're seeing images from the set, great cast, things like that, that can help your your movie do a lot better. So I feel like from that aspect, you know, those are pros and cons of the internet's impact on cinema. Uh, I'm going to let my other co-hosts speak on it. Maybe they have some different things that they've seen, uh, you know, with the internet's impact, and I'll just let them go into it. Kage, let's go. Uh, Yeah, so... I there's definitely pros and cons uh, to the internet in terms of how it affects cinema. Um, you know, we live in the digital age where everyone has a camera. There are cameras everywhere. That being said, whenever something is being filmed, I guarantee you somebody is out there walking a dog up in their apartment balcony, looking down, and they can see uh, filming going on of some kind. And once something goes on the internet, it is there forever. Um, Biggest examples, just look on Reddit. Reddit uh, showed, uh, I don't know how far in advance, the Last of Us series on HBO uh, showing that was filmed. And seeing movies being made, just speaking in general, it's exciting. You know, you see a film crew, you see stars, people get curious what's going on. It's kind of like... When you're driving on the road and you see a car accident and everyone slows down, kind of a similar concept. It's like, oh, I see something that I don't normally see every day. What's going on over here? And in the case of cinema, people whip out their phones. And this is what I saw. Oh, I think this movie is being made. And then now we go down the rabbit hole. Now we start the rumor mill. And in some aspects, that's good. In some aspects, that's bad. If I, you know... Again, I've spoken on it many times. Uh, I'm an avid gamer, and if I hear about a movie being made that I think could be based on a video game that I like, I'm like, ooh, now I'm going to pay attention. But at the same time, uh, the internet spoils things. I think we've all seen trailers that show off just a little too much. Um, But when it comes to the internet, we get spoilers before trailers come out. And that's a problem. And I'm not really sure what the solution of that problem is. You can't get rid of the internet. It's too ingrained in our culture, not just U.S. culture, but worldwide. We depend on the internet for so many things. Um, So, yeah, that's that's definitely a pro and a con. You know, you you find out that a movie is coming out and you're excited about it, but then you keep getting information about it. And because you Googled it, now you're going to get stuff shown to you it's like ah like i know it's being i know it's being made that's good enough for me i don't need all this information and once it started you can't really stop it um so that's that's just my thoughts on that um buttons uh yeah so for me when i think about how the internet has impacted cinema i i do agree with kage on this that you know when you have all of this information so readily at your fingertips, uh, just by doing a quick search online, you inevitably are going to run into a situation where you're like, okay, I wanted to see the trailer, but now I know about how this lead actor went into drug rehab and how this other one is, you know, um, leaving the set because of, creative differences with the director or with the studio and oh now the movie might not get made or finished um, and all of these different things that play into the drama around the production of the movie. I think back in the day uh, because I mean this is nothing new the the media has always followed um, you know 
when things are being made, when movies are being made, you know, following the actors, following the production schedule and all of that. Um, because it's, because it's things that people want to know about and they're looking for those juicy little details that they can throw into a news article. But like you said, now everybody's got a camera phone. Now everybody's got access to the internet that they could just write, write up whatever. Uh, and oh yeah, I saw Tom Holland walking down the street. He must be filming the new Spider-Man in town. And then everybody knows. Um, back in the day, it used to be, oh yeah, maybe I saw Tom Holland walking down the street and only the people in that town or, you know, small little area are going to be notified and know that Tom Holland's in town. Um, not globally, everybody will now know within 10 minutes, as soon as I upload it to my Instagram account, this picture that I snuck of him, you know, walking out of the, you know, the local eatery. Um, so for that pure uh, reason of, you know, instantaneous, uh, you know, notifications and things like that, and the fact that you can literally go online and everybody, um, you know, has access to this information about an actor or a movie or a studio uh, about projects that they're working on, it does take away some of that, um, you know, unknowns, that you might have been excited for. You're like, oh yeah, it's going to come out soon and, 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 and I'm hoping that there's going to be some big surprise or there's going to be you know, a lot of information, new information about a character or a book or a movie that, I've, that I love. And it's now ruined because the internet just can't let it go. They can't just be like, hey, it's coming yeah. out in March. I'll go see it in March. They're like, no, I need to put out 20 different trailers you know, because the studios think that if they don't continue to release that content out on the web, that they're not going to maintain people's interest ah, to go see yeah. it. Good point. And then you've got to you know, constantly be in your face. Exactly. Oh, yep. Yeah. Every time you, you know, you watch your favorite YouTube channel or whatever, that little ad's got to pop up for 20 seconds that's, hey, go watch the new trailer, you know, that just came out or or it just throws the new trailer on there. And sometimes it's a teaser trailer. And sometimes it's like a five minute trailer where you're like, okay, well, I just, now I know everything about the movie and there's no mystery anymore. Right. It's <laughs> like an ADHD type effect where they almost feel that th their planning needs to be surrounded around getting in your face as many times as possible because they don't feel that you'll be able to retain any information two weeks from now. And it goes into the next topic, which we kind of sprinkled over, like the pros and the cons of the digital age, along with the internet, of course. Mm -hmm. Pros, I get more information. I like getting information, right? I like having insight, especially things that I'm interested in. Cons, I get too much information. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. it's kind of spoiled it for me. For instance, I'm already seeing reviews for a movie that comes out in March that we're all excited for. I'm not watching those reviews. Like, you know, the movie's not out. I know you guys are trying to be first through the gate to get views, right? But I know as a person, and I have to take personal accountability, I'm not clicking that and I'm not watching it because mm -hmm. I want to see the movie for myself. I don't need to know everything about the movie before it comes out, especially if it's a movie I've been waiting to see for a couple years. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of like the pros and cons of the digital age as well. The fact that you can get information that you might want to hear, but the fact that you might get information that you don't want to hear. And it's just like, ah, oh, man, what the heck? What do you think about, Kage, about that, like as far as specifically the pros and cons of digital age? We talked about the internet ruining yeah. cinema, but the digital age and the information that you have access to. Now, yeah, no, I agree. Do you want less in a I, sense sometimes? I agree with that 100%. Yeah. I, I feel like, but, and, and the, the hard part about it is that it really depends on the film. If you told me a little bit of information about uh, Madam Web, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know anything about this character and about this story. And I know now you're telling me a movie's coming out. Okay, I'm informed. I'm okay with that information. I'm okay with the information that I look at on my own where I'm like, okay, I'm, I want to know more about this character. But that's where it stops. Now, if you keep posting articles, Instagram, TikToks, YouTube, of showing me, oh, we heard this rumor, or oh, behind the scenes, this is going on, or hey, we saw them filming at this location, we see these characters. Okay, now you're, you're going too much. Okay, all I needed to know was the movie, that the movie's coming out, 
and what's it about, what's the character about. That's all I need to know. But I feel like today, movie, not all, but movies are just showing a little bit too much. I think one of the biggest defenders of that is Marvel. Mm-hmm. They show way, way too much mm-hmm. uh, in their previews a lot of times. Uh, let me see the movie. Let me experience it. Dune. We are, we are all Dune fans here. We want to see that. I don't need every interview under the sun. I don't need to know all your, your filming backstory. No, I'm already sold. You, you had me. Yeah. And I think what it boils down to is um, confidence. Confidence in your material. You don't need to, like, if you are confident in your material, you don't need to hit me with an article every two days. You don't have to hit me with eight trailers. Like, you showed me one, maybe two trailers tops. Okay, I'm sold. If I'm committed, I'm if I'm if I'm committed. If your story is good enough, you believe in it enough, right. then that's all you need to do. And yeah. that, that tells me something about your confidence as a director, as a marketing team. If you feel the need to do this, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if you're if how how your story is going to hold up right. when and you present everything. It to me. Like you made up a good point because everything has a cost and it takes time. And the more trailers that they're making and putting on social media and pushing people to watch that costs money which is why you see the budget start to get out of control Mm -hmm. especially on the marketing side we just said madam webb 60 million 75 percent of it was just i guess you could say social media marketing Mm -hmm. you know what i mean now it makes sense that's what you target but did you have to spend 60 million yeah that's almost as much as the budget to make the movie i would rather them invest their money in the story in the plot versus marketing marketing is important don't get me wrong but i would rather you see put more money in making a good Good story putting good product good special effects rather than putting out money to for let's see how many interviews we can get and unfortunately that's a great point kage unfortunately the marketing i would say at this point in time and it depends on the ip the marketing is more important than the ip at this point Mm-hmm. It's the marketer, right? You know yeah. what I mean? The marketer is the one that gets people watching. Because if you don't have any marketing, it's not going to do anything. It doesn't really matter who's in the film. Like, it'll do decent. But the marketing and getting in front of eyeballs is what gets people to go. That goes with yeah. anything in business. Cinema is no different. Entertainment is all the same. <laughs> the marketing budgets, I'm surprised. Like I said, I thought it was it was interesting that it was closer to the Madam Web budget because it's $80 million. So to me, it's like extreme, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine if it was $200 million. Did they put 150 in? You know what I mean? When you're putting in 150 and it's almost as much as it costs to make the movie, make to movie, you know that that's how important marketing is to these studios it's like wow yeah uh buttons what do you think about like the pros and cons specifically of like the digital age uh yeah so for you know i will i will go ahead and and kind of touch a little bit on what you're talking about as well as far as the media and the press around uh promotion uh for a movie and and basically when you were having your whole conversation the the first thing that popped into my mind is actually one of my favorite movies, uh, and I don't believe either one of you have seen it, but it's called America's Sweethearts. So shout out to anyone, any of our listeners who've, you know, either you've watched that movie and you like it, or somebody drug you to the movie and, you know, your wife or your significant other or whoever was like, we're going to watch this chick flick, because yes, it is a chick flick, but it's it's all the wonderful things about cinema in general and given to you in kind of like a very kind of dark humor way. Um, But it's Billy Crystal, and I love Billy Crystal, so (laughs) so I will just just leave it at that. But it it talks about, um, you know, productions and movies and the promotion of movies, because that's what this that movie kind of centers around is, hey, this movie's coming out and we have to get all of these um, movie reviewers and uh, people like that who are going to come, the media, and to promote this movie. And so now with the digital age, you know, they don't don't have to worry. So, I mean, they still do those things. They still have the big reviewers like Variety and Hollywood Insider and all these, you know, super big uh, companies do their movie reviews, but because anybody can do a YouTube channel or a podcast or a website or anything like that, there's all this extra content out there. Now, granted, you know, most of those average laymen are not going to have access 
to um, preview the movies, you know, the way that the, the bigger companies and the bigger um, reviewers would, uh, just like how there's international releases versus, you know, um, movie releases in, in the U.S. Uh, and so obviously those people are going to be able to see the movie in advance. This is the same thing with, with these uh, reviewers that they have. Now, for me, that would be the pro that, you know, you go out there and you can find all this content, all these different people who have different opinions. And if you find somebody that you like and you're like, I trust their judgment every time I go and I listen to them, they are spot on with whether or not I'm going to like this movie uh, or a TV show or whatever. And then the con to that, obviously, is what Kage and Neff already mentioned, which is I'm going to get too much information. I'm going to get a negative review from somebody that's going to say, hey, don't go watch this movie because, oh, and by the way, here's the spoiler, you know, and, and then everybody knows and everybody can then spread that information so quickly. And, you know, all of these production companies that are releasing these movies have to sit there and say, how do we prevent this from happening? And a lot of the times that means throwing extra money for secrecy and they can't always yeah. get that, especially because, you know, it went from closed sets, um, you know, back in the day to now these are too big to have a closed mm. set anymore. Some of these productions are so massive and require so much, uh, you know, extra technical support or, you know, stand-ins or whatever that it's hard to keep that secret and keep certain aspects of a movie hidden because, they're just so massive. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, back in the day, movies, if you've ever, ever watched like an old black and white movie or even probably all the way up until like the 50s and 60s, they always had all the credits at the beginning of the film. Like you go and you watch it and it's like, oh, here's your yeah, cast, right. here's your production, here's your cameramans and, uh, and you know all the other things um, involved in that movie. And it was like the first, I don't know, couple minutes of the movie. And now... You know, they, they moved that to the end for two reasons. One, because people didn't like watching all the credits and, and stuff at the beginning. Um, and then two, because there's now so much extra, you know, everybody that's involved uh, on that scrolling credit scene, just, you know, thousands of people involved with these movies. And sometimes it's not even the individual people. Sometimes it's a company. Like, look at all yeah. these companies that were involved. That's also all those people that work for those companies that are also involved in the making of this movie. And I think that is probably, you know, where you get into that con of this digital age is the fact that because so many hands and uh, companies and different things go into the production of these movies, that means that when something like this fails, when, when a movie like Argyle had a $200 million budget and it fails, all those people who put all of that time and money and effort and, um, you know, production value into these movies and it fails like that, it just, it's, it's why cinema is failing. Right. You know, and, and it's not just, cause like I said, back in the day, maybe you're, maybe you had like a small local, you know, person who would report on movies and say like, Hey, yeah, we went and saw it and, and you guys should go see it too. And now it's like, oh, you know what? This podcaster that I like to listen to, he told me that movie was trash, so I'm not going to go see it now. Um, or, yep. or, this, or this YouTube guy that I like to watch, he spoiled the movie for me by telling me every bit of you know, exciting thing that happened in the movie, so why go spend my money at the movies? Because I already know the big reveal. I already know that Ruined. it was... I already know it was that guy who killed the guy. Exactly. You know, like, I know the story. Yeah, hey, kill good, Dumbledore. Good points, Buttons. <laughs> yeah. Kage, you had some info? Uh, yeah, so one, uh, one thing uh, that I just found is that one uh, pro uh, to the internet is uh, for independent movies... Mm. Okay, independent movies seem to get their find their ground on streaming services. And if we didn't have the internet, we would, you know, people wouldn't know about those movies. There's a lot of hidden gems out there. 
Yeah. You know what How I mean? many people have actually gone to the Sundance I think that's Fan why Festival. I think, but I think that's why A twenty four has come up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, because yeah. I think really you're, they're you're a distributor. Right. I don't think they really. I'm not going to say they've never actually made films, but I think they really distribute those films that were made by maybe indie people mm-hmm. on that mainstream platform. That's what mm-hmm. I think A twenty four does. You know what I mean? I believe so. Yeah. Um, let's see. Don't don't hate me, everybody. Uh, that movie. Mid midsummer, yeah, yeah, yeah. mid summer, summer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> I don't know, uh, something favorite. like that. I, I, I saw it. I, I saw it online. Mm-hmm. I saw it online. Are are a twenty four movies getting in? They're in, they're in theater, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk okay. to I'll talk to me. The movie you saw is in that's a twenty four. Touche. Okay, and that was Midsummer was also in theater. Hereditary. Yeah, Hereditary. Yeah, yeah. and I really enjoyed. Uh, well, I really enjoyed Talk to Me. Yes. Midsommar, uh, for me, uh, cult movies f- creep me out. They creep mm-hmm. me out. It's a lot. Of, it's, it's funny, the stuff I, I will watch, I'll digest and believe. Cult movies, it was too close smiling. To uh, I'm like, what <laughs> is happening? And it was like, let's just see how dark and twisted can we make this. I'm going to go watch Silent Hill to make myself feel better. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's dark. No, I, I, I honestly, <laughs> I, I will say that definitely is a pro. I mean, you know, um, I'm sure as far as distribution is concerned, you know, when you have these movies that are put out by, you know, up and coming uh, producers or directors or uh, even with like actors and actresses, you know, you see them do these little indie films. And again, like I mentioned, who all is going to Sundance? There's not a whole lot of people who will be, ever be able to experience going to a Sundance Film Festival and seeing all these independent films on the big screen like this. But with the internet, you can now see these films when they, you know, when they're released online. Mm-hmm. You can go and sit down and and get the Sundance Channel, you know, yeah. and they have they have all of these things, you know, that back in the day you wouldn't have you wouldn't have ever been able to experience that unless right. you actually went right. to the festivals right um, and so it's great it's great exposure it's great way to you know connect with your audience um, you know to get those type of films that people will now be able to have uh, an opportunity to experience that they wouldn't have been able to before and or you know for maybe even years later that they might not have been able to experience um, depending on you know when when those films come to the US some of those will never come to the US some of these smaller yeah you that's, know that's uh, an excellent point they bring it to a bigger market right so with with international and Netflix and prime and Hulu they've all been really good I I don't have a lot of the other streaming services, so I don't know if they also have a large international catalog. But, you know, some of our favorite shows, um, you know, even like Marianne that, you know, Neff and I, we've, we've watched that and really truly enjoyed that. We wouldn't have not had opportunity to watch that if, if there Netflix, was no Netflix. Yeah, without mm-hmm. Netflix. So what a that's great definitely point. a pro. What a great point. Let's discuss less is more theory. I know Kage came up with this theory. It was a real good one. And we could talk about this as far as less is more different aspects of cinema. I like to talk about less is more as far as trailers goes because I yeah. feel like the more trailers I get, the more they're showing me the movie and the less I'm going to be able to see in the theater and really say, hey, wow, I didn't see that coming or I didn't see that. How many times have we seen a trailer and you're like, well, well I just seen the 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 beginning the middle and the end I think I'll pass on that one and you might go see it you know what I mean but I feel like movies or studios when they push a film like that it is because they are trying to overcompensate and gather up as much interest as possible but sometimes you don't have to do that the creator didn't have to do that I saw the first trailer eighty million dollar yeah. film and I said I think I need to go watch that I was on the uh, outs on it originally but I was like you know what I need to go watch that film. And it, like I said, it's one of the best films I've seen in three years, and I stand on that. I actually bought it recently. It's here. But, <laughs> but, uh, Good choice. Good yeah, choice. Yeah, but I think trailers is really the big area where I feel like less is more. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't need four trailers for one movie. Two max. Give me a trailer three, four months out, possibly. Six months isn't that bad either. Give me one a month out. Do the marketing online. Hopefully the movie's good. Mm-hmm. Good word of mouth will help you. Once again, like Kage said, it's about the product. If the product is good, 
things will work themselves out. Not everything is going to be a blockbuster. And I understand that the business is based off the business of making money. That makes sense. But I feel like when you have good product, good people that care about the product, eventually things will turn around. We saw this with, uh, with Dennis uh, Villeneuve, where Blade yeah. Runner 2049. Blade Runner 2049 is not a blockbuster. I've told Buttons about this Kage. I like Blade Runner 2049 a lot. Dune. It, I thought it could have did a little more, but it did better than Blade Runner 2049. And based off what the studio wanted to see, it was a success. Mm. That's a perfect example. The first thing might not work out perfectly. You know what I mean? But if we keep this person involved in this sci-fi-esque uh, realm that he loves and he's really good at and he has the eye for, it's going to work. And that's what you see from Blade Runner 2049 and Dune. And I think those movies are both uh, comparable to each other. I think they're both solid movies. He also did Arrival, and I need to watch that as well. So just that's just an example of what I'm saying is less is more and not to focus so much on uh, do we need to overexpose our product to the, um, to the consumer so we can sell it. Kage, what you got on that? Well, I was, I was going to say, first off, I'm shocked you didn't see the Arrival. Very good movie, everybody. Go watch it. Uh, def definitely different uh, sci-fi. Um, yeah, the less is more theory, I agree uh, with Neff on that. Um, Trailer-wise, yeah, you don't need to show me everything. I feel like, for me personally, I want two trailers. I want one trailer to tell me that the movie, that this movie is coming out. Like a teaser. Yeah, yeah. Like, show me, give me a trailer to let me know, hey, this movie is coming out, here's what it's about. And then the second trailer, give me that, like, maybe a month prior to release to let, to remind me, hey, that movie that we mentioned a year ago, six months ago, whatever, it's coming out, and here, we're going to remind you that it's coming out. That's all I need. I don't need three, four trailers, especially if the movie is an hour and a half and you just showed me eight trailers. I'm like, okay, I don't need to see it anymore. You know, uh, I don't remember what the tra how many trailers were there for uh, Lord of the Rings. Very long movie, right? Yeah. How many trailers were for that? Do we know offhand? I, I, I mean, I would say maybe two or three. Two or three? And, and, and that might be a bad example because that's a long movie. Two or three trailers, you can still show enough to get people interested and engaged um, without giving away too much just because it's so long. But then again, that has the whole Lord of the Rings book community uh, behind that. But um, another thing of less is more it, for me is also uh, special effects. Um, I don't think you need to do excessive CG. I think if you're going to do CG, do it where it makes sense. Obviously, case in point, uh, Avatar, there's no such thing as 10-foot-tall blue people and neon glowing plants and animals, so it makes sense you're going to have CG there. Argyle with, with the CG cat winking, that I was like, no, please don't, please don't, <laughs> you know, but I, but uh, yeah, ultimately, it, when it comes to CG, I would like to see less of it, like make it more impactful and make it make sense when and where you use it. Um, and then, and less is more on the actors too. Uh, you don't have to hit me with a full star cast. If you had one actor, triple A actor, I'm like, all right, I'm good. Not to say that that makes a movie. Like our most recent example, Argyle had a killer all star cast, mm -hmm. did not do very well. Right. Just because you have an all star cast doesn't mean you're gonna you're gonna knock it out of the park. But flip side, Devil's Advocate. Just because you don't have any AAA actors doesn't mean it's going to be crap. You know what I mean? I've seen some uh, low movies. Uh, we talked about it a few times. Saw. I have no idea who those actors were. I've never heard of James Wan before that. Or, or uh, Tobin, Tobin Bell, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who played Jigsaw. I don't know. But that was low budget filmed by three guys in one room. Ended up spawning an entire franchise that spans what 20 years yeah, yeah you know what i mean so there, there's really a, a give and take but i feel like there's too much of an emphasis on throwing as many actors as much cg as much trailers as we can to sell the movie no man just have faith in your product right show a trailer or two i'm engaged all right i'm in right buttons uh yeah so i mean when you're talking about trailers for movies uh i definitely agree that there's a big difference in the last, you know, 20 years between the trailers that we saw as kids growing up, 
Uh, I honestly, I think most of the trailers kind of went with a voiceover. Um, you know, not necessarily the kids ones, but all the adult movies kind of had that voice, that voiceover in a world where nothing seems as it should be, yeah. you know, and they, and they kind of will drag you into the story Two people, you know, fight against all odds, you know, and, and it just, it just was a much simpler delivery method to get you all the pertinent information. Hey, it's a disaster movie. These two people are fighting to save the world. Or as the world is crumbling around, they're fighting for their survival. Whatever it is, they always just kind of basically told you. Um, and then maybe had like a couple little clips, a couple little quotes or quick little, you know, conversations or whatever to get you excited to about the actors or actresses that are in the movie. They're like, ha ha ha, isn't this so funny? I, I told this joke. Um, and, you know, when it comes to that, I felt like it was, you know, you had, you had two very possible uh, outcomes with that. Either you knew exactly what the movie was going to be in terms of, hey, this is going to be a movie uh, about disaster movies or whatever. Like this is, that's what it's going to be. I need to know the world is ending. These are the actors and, and the volcano is going to kill everybody. Like that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can go sit down and watch that movie movie knowing, all right, this is what it's going to be. My dad always told me he was like, this movie was marketed as this big romantic movie and it's called hope floats. And, and he always called it poop floats <laughs> because he was sitting there and he's like, I thought what I was sitting down to watch was going to be this like romantic movie. And he's like, it was, he was like, it was so sad. It was so, he was like, this is not what I thought this movie was going to be. It's not uplifting at all. Um, <laughs> so he's like, he always called it poop, poop floats. <laughs> and, you know, I, I will say that, you know, with the advance of the internet and everything else, you're going to find out whether or not a movie is true to what it is because people are going to post about it and you're going to know within, you know, 24 hours of the release of that movie, yeah. all of your local friends and, you know, people that you go to for information on these things, they're going to go ahead and tell you. They're going to be like, dude, that movie was not what it was supposed to be. Right. Like it was like... If, if you, you thought that was what it was going to be, it's not. <laughs> Makes sense. Good, good. Let's talk about new age movie stars. My question is, are there any new age movie stars based off, let's say, I guess, personal criteria, like compared to movie stars in 70s, 80s, 90s? Do you think that exists anymore? So I will say that, you know, based off of what you're basically saying, the only people that I will really call a new age movie star is not different from how they were back then. You're still going to have your singers, you know, turned actor. Like that's mm, still pretty common. Yeah. Um, you're still going to have your, oh, they were cute as kids and now they're adults. You know, so the child actors that grow into these roles, like maybe they started out on Disney Channel and now they're, you know, like like Zac Efron would be an example, right? Like he had his his start in Disney and now he's making more adult films as far as the content and everything. He's not a child actor anymore. Um, so we still are seeing that where, you know, so the crossovers from going from a TV show to a movie star and of course like singers going into acting roles. But, and even like, we're seeing wrestlers. Hulk Hogan was one of the very famous, you know, wrestlers and he started doing, you know, these movies. So you still see that crossover from that. I think the only new age part that you could say is like uh, people like Jojo Siwa or whatever her name is, where um. she had her YouTube channel um, and things like that. So she's a purely internet Sensation. Fandom. But yeah, let's like more specifically cinema though. Uh well well no, but that's what I'm saying. I think I think you're gonna be able to see the crossover like from a transition from, from doing internet activity yeah, and yeah. then actually and, becoming mm -hmm. to take basically you can take your, your following well, from your internet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and that's what I mean, I've seen some T V shows yeah. um that have done like 
hey, we're going to audition people off of online mm. uh, and put them in It's roles. almost like an evolution. Yeah, it's almost like a contest, too. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, like, I feel who like gets the most likes and views? That's, that's who it. we're going to put in our movie. That is dead on right there. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up because it makes me think from a different perspective. Yeah, I, it might not be exactly what you were going for with your question, but... Like, who's of, the next Tom Cruise? Right, well, is, there, is that even possible? Well, yeah, I mean, and, and is it, should it be somebody who has been acting their whole life or should it be somebody who, you know, had enough subscribers to put them on the screen? Do you think maybe in those... Like Mr. Beast now is Mr. Yeah. Impossible. Uh, do, you th- do you think that in those other eras of film, there was less nepotism? Oh, heck no. There's tons of nepotism. No, but I'm saying like in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, there was tons of nepotism. Then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and I, uh, I did some research on that. I've seen like a lot of ties with certain actors like Jamie Lee Curtis, a few others, like yeah. stuff like that. But it just seems like maybe there could be too much oversaturation of yeah. just um, not necessarily people within Hollywood because Hollywood is still small, but maybe too much oversaturation in the amount of product that's actually being put out. Right, I think maybe that's why you're not seeing the ability to stick and be around for 40 years. I'm really trying to think around who has the chops to be around for 40 years. Maybe the only, and and also enough too to where it's like this person could be respected. Like I think Robert Pattinson might be one of them, just based off his ability to act. Like I think Robert Pattinson will be able to act in 30 years from now, and you'll be like, "Oh, Robert Pattinson's mm. been around for 40 years, but well, he's not a movie star to me. He's a good actor. He's not a movie. St- you don't say, oh, like when we went when we went to go see the Batman, we were like, we're gonna go see the Batman. Robert Pattinson is Batman. I was confident in it. A lot of people weren't confident in in Robert Pattinson because they haven't done their research on Robert Pattinson, mm. right? I can see how the Twilight stuff can get you confused, but that guy's been in some pretty crazy movies and he's really kicked the door in with his acting and I like him as an actor and I when I heard he was cast as Batman I thought it was going to work immediately but I didn't say I want to go see the Robert Pattinson movie right remember when uh Terminator came out it was like Arnold Schwarzenegger's in it I gotta see it or like stuff like that so it's it's, like that it's a transition from Van Damme's in it I gotta Sylvester Stallone's in it I gotta see it that's what what do you see now that even translate to that. I don't think well, is it possible now. I think I think the only people that we really even see uh, any of that kind of buzz around uh, is like maybe Brad Pitt, um, Matt Damon, and he's maybe. a completely different generation. Um, That's what right. I'm getting and, at. And yeah, no, like you legacy said, legacy act these basically. Are, these are these are legacy DiCaprio. people. Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> I'm gonna go watch the new Leo movie. Um, and and again, it's not just a matter of oh, this is one of their new movies that they're putting out. When you look at movie stars back in the day, like John Wayne would be a good example. It's like he's pumping out a new movie every year. Um, and and again, so you could compare that to like Jackie Chan. He puts out like a couple of movies a year. Uh, I mean, he might have slowed down a little bit, but back in the day when he was pumping them out every year he was putting one out in the u.s and one out in china and you know sometimes it would you know the movies that he had in china would just come over to the u.s uh dubbed um but basically they were heavy into production as far as those movies went they you know they they rushed them out basically they had a formula they followed the formula copy uh, and paste and you know, put out a new movie. Now it's now it's another movie. Um, I think, you know, with the speed of change that we've seen in how movies are made and produced and edited, all the software that we have now that helps, you know, expedite those processes. AI. Yeah. Oh. AI. <laughs> I mean, all of all of these different things um, are, and then also, you know, like Kage mentioned. You know, you have the competition now from these small independent films because it's a lot easier to get their content out there too. So, you know, it's flooding this market with all of these different options. And I mean, you know, no one person is ever going to see 
all of everything that's been of produced. Of course. Yeah. Um, and even within their lifetime, we're not even talking about stuff that was put out before they were born. I'm just talking about stuff that's made within their lifetime. There's no way. Um, just, you know, limited availability to the content as well as the sheer volume of the content that's put out. Um, it, it's just not going to be possible. So as far as these blockbuster films are concerned or these actors that tie themselves, you know, to blockbuster films, you're not going to have that anymore where it's all like, oh, here's the new, you know, um, I don't know, Robert, like you said, Robert Pattinson movie. Here's the new Robert Pattinson movie. And next year you're going to have another Robert Pattinson movie. All these movies are getting pushed out you know, because of the extra that goes into them, the CG and the special effects and the editing and all that, even though we have made that process easier and, and uh, quicker, it still means that a movie is going to go into filming and production and take two to three years to put, you know, before it goes out onto the screen. Um, you know, from, from cradle to grave, basically. Mm. That's mm-hmm. two to three years. Um, and back in the day, they probably pumped them out and, you know, Filmed them, produced them, edited them, whatever, and had them out within a year. Uh, right. You know, because they were simpler. They yeah. they didn't have all the extra. Right. Right. They didn't have all. You didn't the have the crazy post production and exactly. work on the set while they're actually filming. Kage, how do you feel about what we just brought up there? Yeah, you know, I feel like um, one the one thing to observe is the uh, the back in the nineties, back in the day, we didn't have internet. And you got to think about how big some movies were, and we didn't have internet. And now you look at it, you compare it to now, and you, it kind of makes me wonder, like, how? Mm. You know, how did they do? Go- I think a big movie that comes to mind uh, is uh, Independence Day mm. in 96, 97. Um, that was a big deal. That was a huge movie when it came out. Still one of my favorite movies. Um, we won't talk about the new ones, but <laughs> but like but the first movie was a real gem, and back then it's 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 like we didn't we didn't have the internet. You heard an article on and you read it in the paper. We saw the trailer, maybe two, and then it came out and it was amazing. Toys, video games, cartoons. I remember. Yeah. I, yeah, leading, I think leading up to yeah, the movie, yeah, yeah, or even after the movie came out, you'd have all of these little extra spinoffs, mm-hmm. chances for studios to grab. I mean, look at Lucas Films. I yeah. mean, look Great at example. all of all of the merchandise that would have come out of all the Star Wars stuff. I mean, you know, the movies themselves, they made money, but with the merchandising, they probably made five to ten times more money with merchandising than they made off of just ticket sales for those movies. Yeah, absolutely. But it's like without the internet, those movies were able to make good money, mm-hmm. make good on their return. And nowadays we have the internet both informing and spoiling. Um, and we still have everything we mentioned earlier. We have articles, not newspapers anymore. Um, we have toys. We have video games, uh, Lego games, uh, to be more specific specific you know we have lego star wars you know when there's a new star wars movie coming out they come out with a lego star wars game um and and then you have your action figures and all that stuff so it's just really interesting to see how the internet has changed cinema uh from the 90s to now Mm -hmm. and and be even before before that you know what i mean it's really interesting to see that um that trend over over the decades makes a lot of sense do you think big name actors influence box office numbers anymore, guys? I think it definitely I think you're definitely going to get more people interested depending on who the actor or actress is mm-hmm. uh into d- finding out more about the movie. Um and you know, even we talked about Henry Cavill a lot as far as we know the projects he tends to pick are more passionate uh, you know, about what the content is because he likes, he likes comic books and he likes, um, you know, basically kind of the, the geekier, you know, side of things. Like he, he wants to be true to the, the characters and the roles that he takes. Um, you know, I'm not saying that he hasn't done films where he doesn't, you know, have a direct tie to, like, I'm not saying he doesn't pick up work that 
isn't directly tied to something he likes. I'm sure he's picked up all kinds of, you know, roles in the past. But the catalog that I know of his either has a book uh, associated with it or a comic book associated with it. So, um, you know, he, he definitely has a style and a type of movie that he likes to be associated with. But other actors like Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, all of those guys, um, Ben Affleck, you know, those actors can sometimes just be kind of like a buzzword to, to get you interested in talking about the movie, finding out what the movie is and what it's about. Um, I don't think anymore you're going to have those ones uh, where people are purely driven to the theater by that actor. I don't think they're going to sit there and go, oh, well, you know, this is the new Matt Damon movie and he can do no wrong. And, and I mean, it's not like John Wayne. Uh, you know, he's, yeah. he's not John Wayne. He can't sit there and go, well, it's another John Wayne movie, so therefore it's a Western and I'm going to go see it because I like Westerns and I like John Wayne. You know, those, those are not directly correlated anymore, I don't think. Makes sense. I have to agree with that. I feel like, you know, the big name can stir up interest that doesn't necessarily translate to the movie having legs. We've seen a lot of movies with big names, Edge of Tomorrow, and mm -hmm. it wasn't marketed properly, and I've heard that's a really good sci-fi film it, with Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt. These are pretty mm -hmm. good. It's very I'd good. say A-list. Well, Tom Cruise is definitely A-list. Emily Blunt, you can argue I'd say she's A-list at this point. Yeah. Two great actors. Movie didn't perform well. No. Not a lot of people even knew about it. That's the perfect example. So just because you have big names, yeah, it's cool as far as the, um, I guess, as far as the production of the film, but that has nothing to do with the other things that have to go in and come into play to getting that movie out to people mm -hmm. to get oh, them yeah. to watch it. But I do feel like it is important to have at least actors that know how to act. Yeah. Kage brought it up with Saw. Really no big names in there. Um, Danny Glover was in that, correct? Yes. You're right. He He's was probably the, big... the only one. And then uh, and the main character at Jigsaw, I know I've seen him in The Firm with Tom Cruise mm -hmm. in, I believe, is either the late 80s or the 90s. I've seen him before in that But film. like you said, not super big names. Right, but it wasn't, just, it wasn't like Will Smith, you know, De Niro, Al Pacino, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, it, it is important to an extent, but you want to have a great product. We saw big names with Cavill in... Um, Affleck and Batman vs. Superman, the screenplay was terrible. Mm -hmm. The movie did what it did, right? You see what I mean? Now, mm -hmm. that movie might have made some money. I really don't think that movie made what they wanted to, but I don't think it flopped either. But the thing is, the reception, in my opinion, to that movie wasn't that good. And personally, I didn't care for the movie. So, mm -hmm. big actors, movie not that good. You get what you get out of that. Right. That's just how I feel about it. So, I feel like big names, they matter to an extent. You got to do everything else. Kage? I feel like writing good writing a good story at the end of the day is king that is just my opinion uh like you guys just said you know you can throw all the triple a actors you want but if the story's crap it's crap mm -hmm. you know you, you you can't turn crap into gold you can't and and you know you've got a big you've got a big difference between the writing that happened back in the day in hollywood versus what it is today now true true now, to some extent, you can look at uh, one example would be Ocean's Eleven. So mm, okay. Ocean's Eleven was a lot of big names back in the day. Dean Martin, um, uh, they had, I think they had Jimmy Stewart in there, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, they, they, had, a, they had a lot of big names uh, in the original Ocean's Eleven. And then, of course, when they rebooted it, they also got big names. George Clooney, mm -hmm. Matt Damon, Brad Pitt. I mean, they, they pulled they an They went all, all out. Yeah, they pulled an all-star cast. Now, they did have some names that weren't as big. Um, but as far as the main characters went, they tried to pull in some, um, you know, even if they weren't super big yet, they were still established actors mm -hmm. uh and and that kind of led to you know okay we're making a remake but we have to make the story as good as the original one otherwise you're not paying um homage to the yes original, right good point the original rat pack or whatever you want to call it that cast 
that uh, really made that movie stand out and be an, an enjoyable movie for that generation. Because I think that a lot of the people that were in the newer Ocean's Eleven probably would have grown up watching of course. the original. Of course. And they would have said, oh man, I love this and I would love to be attached to that product. And now nowadays we have so many remakes, so many reimaginings and reproductions of older films that it makes it to where we're like, okay, are we making a direct copy? No, we have to have new writing. Well, uh, we want to make it bigger than the original. Let's add more CG. Let's add more explosions. Let's add more to this. And then what ends up happening is you see either a reduction in the quality of the writing because they're like, oh, we're going to save money by doing it this way or because we have to edit the story so much to add more of those things that we want to, to where the, the writing just goes to crap. So again, as Kage mentioned, you can throw as many AAA actors as you want on it, but if your writing's not there, then you're going to have this this production that looks like a complete mess. Um, because even though you even though you had all these people who were like, yes, let's do it better than the original, you're you're not going to have a story that flows cohesively and ends up delivering a product where. You know, even the actors are like, what did I just do? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I loved the original, and we just made a piece of crap. Right, and what did I get out of it? <laughs> and, and, you know, something that comes to mind as we're talking about this, I think of uh, the mo- the remake of Mortal Kombat. I didn't know of any of those actors. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you guys. Well, I knew, I knew about I, some well, cool I knew about Shang Tsung, the guy who plays Shang Tsung. I've seen him. Okay, I knew him. I knew, uh, uh, what was it? Liu Kang? Well, no, I knew. Well, I found out about him later. He was he was uh, in Power Rangers, mm-hmm. but um, no, Scorpion, of course. Oh yeah, I, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That How one, could I forget I think, that guy. Well, I feel. I'm sorry, everybody. I really don't. I don't <laughs> remember his name, but like I said, this is a guy we've seen in multiple films. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's a good he's a good actor, Asian actor, uh, very awesome actor. But keep going, Kage. Uh, yeah. So generally speaking, though, that movie was. Um, that movie, it, di- it didn't really have a lot of big actors for the most part that I knew about, um, but it was still good, mm-hmm. in, in my opinion, um, of course, because I know some gamers didn't like that that much. I enjoyed it, but yeah, ultimately, you, you just have to have good writing. Um, I think, uh, in my opinion, a good cast or even one good AAA actor can help a movie but they can't save a movie right i've it's never not the end all be all right i've never gone i've never uh went with that thinking of you know this movie was crap but it was saved because this one actor was in it or, or you know what i mean like uh, again mortal Kombat. a lot of people said the movie some people said the movie was okay and that whoever the character that played kano was saved it with his co- comedic relief um I don't think he saved it. I don't think it was. I don't think it was bad. He was definitely funny. He helped it, but he didn't save it. Right. I well, can talk that, about a lot of movies like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think maybe the point that you're trying to make is that you know, depending on who's watching the movie, there's different aspects that they're gonna say. You Pool, know, yeah, that resonated with them from the film. So right. in that situation, it might be that oh yeah, I was. I was watching the movie, but really his character stood out to me and made me enjoy the movie that much more because of the actor or actress that they chose for that role. Um, <clears throat> but I will go ahead and say this about uh, actors and actresses as far as the roles in movies. It, it is important if you have a big name behind a film that they fit the role. Yes. So Excellent simply point. simply going in there and saying, well, you know, this is Scarlett Johansson, so everybody's going to want to see her play the role of Mother Goose. I'm I'm sitting there going, what what do you mean? Like Scarlett Johansson is not Mother Goose. Like that mm-hmm. is not the person that I would. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what that's, that's what we got with that's, that's what we got with Ghost in the Shell. Right, and and so basically. You have all these people who want to tie themselves to these projects. And in some cases, 
these actors and actresses don't even want to get tied to these projects. They get locked into these studio deals where they have to, you know, pick a project with the studio, um, you know, because of a contract that they signed. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, you yeah, signed a three, a three movie uh, project with us. So, you know, here's what you have to choose mm -hmm. from. And if they're presented with crappy choices, like I know uh, Channing Tatum was always hated the fact that he had to do the G.I. Joe movie. Now, me personally, when I watched the G.I. Joe movie, I thought he was the best part of the movie. But um, he actually hated that role. He hated having to play that role, but he was locked into contract, and that's what he ended up getting. Um, mm. But So I, I, do think, I do think one of the biggest things is if you're going to use an actor or an actress to try and promote your movie, make sure they're playing a role that suits them. Yes. That's a good point. I think that's going to do it for this episode, folks. Great episode. Great discussion. Um, you know, if you guys heard this podcast, this episode specifically, and you had any comments on it, because it is, a, it is an interesting topic, and I think, I think uh, if anybody has any opinions, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you say about this, because there might be something that we did miss, but I think it was a great conversation. Please like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell for notifications, and join us for the next episode of the Popcorn Square Podcast. I am Neff signing off with my other co-hosts. Okay. And Buttons. be safe.